Hello everyone and welcome to our module on chest pain and dyspnea. Chest pain and dyspnea are two of the most common presenting complaints among patients who come to the emergency room. And for both of these complaints, there's an enormous differential diagnosis and we won't go through everything that can cause chest pain and dyspnea in this video today. But on this slide, I've shown some of the life-threatening and serious causes of chest pain and dyspnea that you must consider when evaluating patients in the emergency room. For chest pain, the big three diagnoses that you always consider are coronary ischemia, meaning myocardial infarction or unstable angina, also aortic dissection and pulmonary embolism. And I talk about all three of those conditions in detail in other videos. For patients presenting with dyspnea, you also have to consider coronary ischemia because some patients, when they have angina, the sensation they get is of dyspnea and not of chest pain. You also have to consider pulmonary embolism in any patient with dyspnea. And other diagnoses include things like pneumothorax, pneumonia, and heart failure. These are all very common diagnoses that you don't want to miss. In the next few slides, I'm going to go through the workup of chest pain and dyspnea in the emergency room. But before I do that, let me make a couple of general points. In actual practice, you will see the workup modified significantly based on the patient's presentation and symptoms. For example, a patient with a history of cancer who presents with a sudden onset of pleuritic chest pain is highly likely to have a pulmonary embolism and the workup is going to quickly tailor towards making that diagnosis. But nevertheless, in the next few slides, I will give you some general steps that you can follow in the workup of chest pain and dyspnea. And I'm going to go in a stepwise manner from the most important things to do to the least important. Keep in mind, however, in actual practice, many of these things are done simultaneously. So the first step in evaluating any patient with chest pain and dyspnea is to assess the vital signs. And that's because you need to know if the patient is hypotensive or hypoxemic. If the patient has hypotension, then they may need urgent treatment with intravenous fluids or vasopressors. And if the patient has hypoxemia, then they may need oxygen or positive pressure ventilation or mechanical ventilation. Once you've assessed the vital signs, the next step is to get an EKG. This is always done immediately on arrival to the emergency room for patients with chest pain or dyspnea. And the reason this is done is because you want to identify STEMIs. I talk about STEMIs in a video in the cardiology section, but any patient who has ST elevations on their EKG is having an ST elevation myocardial infarction, and that's a medical emergency. And so the EKG can quickly change your management by letting you know the patient is having an ST elevation MI. After you've assessed the vitals and done an EKG, the next step is to perform a physical exam. And that's because the physical exam can often give you clues to the diagnosis and help to guide your management. For example, if you hear wheezing, that suggests the patient may have COPD or asthma. If breath sounds are absent in one portion of the lung, that suggests there could be a pneumothorax or a pleural effusion. And you can hear distant heart sounds in patients who have tamponade. You can see weak pulses in patients who have ischemia and a low cardiac output. So all of these things are clues to what's happening to the patient and can help guide your management. After you've checked the vitals, done an EKG, and done a quick physical exam, the next step if the patient has dyspnea is to obtain a chest x-ray. And that's because the chest x-ray often makes the diagnosis in patients who have dyspnea. It can show things like pulmonary edema. It can show consolidation, like this patient who has a right upper lobe consolidation from pneumonia. A chest x-ray can also show evidence of pneumothorax. A chest x-ray is often obtained in patients with chest pain as well, but it's not as important in that situation. Chest x-ray is not usually helpful in chest pain, but it's very often helpful in patients who have dyspnea. At this point, the next step in the workup of patients with chest pain or dyspnea is to consider a CT angiogram. A CT angiogram can make the diagnosis of pulmonary embolism and aortic dissection, but it's not necessary in all cases. It's only done if the history is suggestive of PE or aortic dissection. And in both the videos on pulmonary embolism and aortic dissection, I talk about the risk factors for these conditions. So in patients who have lots of risk factors for one of these conditions, or an exam or history consistent with these conditions, those patients get a CT angiogram. Other patients do not. Beyond this, there are some blood tests that can be useful in patients with chest pain or dyspnea. A D-dimer level is elevated in patients who have pulmonary embolism. There's also data that it's elevated in cases of aortic dissection. So if you check a D-dimer and it's normal, that's very reassuring that the patient likely does not have a PE or dissection. You can measure a serum BNP level. This will be increased in heart failure, although a high level is not diagnostic of heart failure. You have to also have evidence from physical exam of heart failure. And then a CBC is usually done to look for anemia because anemia can cause patients to be short of breath. It can even potentially cause chest pain. Once you've done all the tests we've talked about up until this point, if you still don't have a diagnosis for the cause of chest pain or dyspnea, many patients will undergo what's called a rule-out myocardial infarction or a rule-out MI protocol. This protocol involves monitoring the patients while two sets of cardiac biomarkers are obtained. 
By two sets, I mean testing for cardiac biomarkers like CK and troponin once and then again about six hours later. And the reason this is done is because the initial CK or troponin can be normal, but six hours later it will be elevated if the patient's ischemic event occurred shortly before they arrived in the emergency room. While you're waiting for the two sets of cardiac biomarkers to return, patients have to be on telemetry. That's because you are trying to rule them out for an ischemic cardiac condition and ischemic cardiac conditions can cause arrhythmias and sudden death. So you have to monitor the patient on telemetry while you're waiting for the biomarkers to return. And so because the patients have to be monitored while they're waiting for the blood test, these patients are often kept in the ER or admitted to the hospital. If the blood tests for CK and troponin return negative, most patients will then have a cardiac stress test to exclude coronary disease as a cause of chest pain or dyspnea. If you've gone through all the tests that we've discussed in this video so far and you still have not made a diagnosis for the cause of chest pain or dyspnea, there is further workup that can be done, but it's individualized to the patient and their symptoms. Patients can have many more tests to pursue a diagnosis, including things like an echocardiogram, a cardiac MRI, a right heart catheterization, or pulmonary function tests. But all these things are only done if the patient or their symptoms is suggestive that the test will be helpful. For most patients who go through the testing we've described so far in this video who do not have a diagnosis, most of those patients will ultimately have nonspecific chest pain or deconditioning. Nonspecific chest pain is the term we give to chest pain in which we can't identify a specific cause. Most of these patients probably have something like a muscle spasm or a gas bubble or stress that caused their chest pain, but we can't identify a cause with any of our testing. And then deconditioning is a very common cause of dyspnea. In patients who don't get regular exercise, if they try to do something that requires heavy exertion, like climbing a steep flight of stairs, they can get very short of breath, and it can be alarming and bring them to medical attention. In those patients, all the testing we described so far will be negative. So I'll finish this video by walking you through two cases where we use the steps I discussed to evaluate patients with chest pain and dyspnea. First case is a 54-year-old man with diabetes and hypertension who presents with 30 minutes of chest pain while walking that has resolved. Now this history sounds like stable angina, but you still have to go through the steps because you don't want to miss anything. This patient could be having an ST elevation MI. This patient could be in cardiogenic shock from myocardial ischemia, so you have to go through the steps one at a time. So we assess the vitals and they are normal, which is good. It means he's not in shock. He's not hypoxemic. Next, we do an EKG, which is normal, and this is also very helpful because we know he's not having an ST elevation myocardial infarction. A quick exam is then normal, followed by placing the patient on telemetry and having him go through a rule-out MI protocol where he has serial testing for CK and troponin, and that testing is also negative. At that point, he's referred for a cardiac stress test, which is positive, and now we have our diagnosis of stable angina. Our second case is a 64-year-old woman with breast cancer who presents with dyspnea for the past one hour. Patients with cancer have a hypercoagulable state, so they are at risk for pulmonary embolism. And pulmonary embolism can cause the abrupt onset of dyspnea. So right away, this sounds like it could be a case of PE. But we don't want to jump to the CT angiogram to diagnose a PE because we might miss something. We still need to go through the steps. So we begin by checking her vitals, and she has hypotension. And by identifying this early, we can begin treatment with intravenous fluids or vasopressors to prevent it from progressing. We don't know why she's hypotensive. It could be from a PE, but there are other causes of hypotension, so we have to keep going through the workup to figure out why she has low blood pressure. Next, we get an EKG, and it shows anterior ST elevations. So now this completely changes our thinking. Now this doesn't look so much like a PE. It looks more like an anterior ST elevation MI. Anterior myocardial infarctions can cause the abrupt onset of dyspnea, just like PE. We move on to the exam, and she has rails in her lungs, elevated jugular venous pressure, and cool extremities. So now we're getting a clearer picture that this woman probably has an anterior ST elevation MI complicated by cardiogenic shock. We then do the chest x-ray, which shows pulmonary edema, and now we can put all this evidence together, and her diagnosis is STEMI with cardiogenic shock. So this is an example of a case that initially looks like pulmonary embolism, but as you go through the steps, you find other things. And that's why it's important to always proceed in a stepwise manner so that you don't miss anything. And that concludes our module on chest pain and dyspnea.